We've all had what's colloquially called a light bulb moment where you've been puzzling over something or someone's been trying to get you to see something, trying to get you to understand a certain point. And suddenly everything sort of falls into place and you go, ah, now I get it. What is actually happening there? Um, I would argue that what's taking place is a shift of perspective. A shift of perspective that is, in some cases, profound. In most cases, I would say not so profound. But it's a shift in perspective that amounts to a greater or lesser paradigm shift. Where the way that you're actually seeing something changes fundamentally. The fundamental point of view, the place from which you are examining that idea or that thought or that point or that logical um, problem or logical idea or logical uh, formula, I suppose. And you go from incomprehension to suddenly, oh, or, you know, it's not always that sudden, but it's like, ah, now I get it. You may still disagree um, at that point. You might not accept what the person has said, but you've wrapped your head, as they say, around the problem you suddenly can come to grips with it. You can see it as a finite thing that you can then examine. Um, a light bulb moment doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with the idea that you're examining. It just means that you understand it, or at least you understand it from a different perspective than you originally understood it. What exactly would that be that kind of minor or greater paradigm shift. A greater paradigm shift, I suppose, would be the sort of thing that happened to Paul on the road to Damascus, where he just suddenly had a complete and utter change. Um, what would you call that, where your perspective changes so profoundly and so fundamentally in either a good or a bad way? Um, Paul had a more or less pleasant one. There's some pretty horrible um, aspects of what happened to him. But overall, in his view of things, and in our view of things, he had a epiphany, a nice sort of paradigm shift, a nice sort of light bulb moment. And there was light involved in his, um, as opposed to a moment of a Lovecraftian sort of light bulb moment where you see reality for what it is, and it drives you insane. And it's a horrific thing. Light bulb moments can be good or bad. What would you call these things? Again, I would say it's, it's a fundamental shift in perspective. Now, what is a perspective? A perspective is a means to make sense of something. It's a means for you to get your teeth into something, to wrap your head around something, um, for you to come to terms with it. In a sense, a perspective is something that you impose upon something else. Um, it, a perspective has a source. The source is consciousness itself. Perspective is a means by which you can train yourself if you're able to shift your perspective constantly to see things from as many different points of view as possible in real time, all the time. And again, a lot of people have said, I'm a perspectivist, not necessarily true, um, any more than I'm a foodist, because I eat all the time. It doesn't mean that I eat in order to eat. I don't live to eat, I eat to live, type thing. Um, I employ perspectivism in order to get a desired result, which is to see reality as bias-free as is humanly possible. And the best way to understand bias is to see the other person's bias. And the way to see that is to learn how to switch perspectives. You're not playing with reality or arguing reality out of existence. 
you, what you're attempting to do is to see reality from as many different perspectives as is possible, not as an end in itself, but to get a closer approximation of what truth actually is. Now again, everybody is seeing reality from a particular perspective. And just because, like, let's say, for example, I become some sort of a master at the art of perspectivism, or the tool, really, of perspectivism, because it's not a, it's not an ism in in some in the sense that, say, a socialist believes in socialism. I don't believe in perspectivism. I simply employ it to to do other things for me. Let's say that I become a master at it, and I can see from the perspective of virtually everybody else on the entire planet. I still may not have actually arrived at any absolute truth claims, but I can then look at everyone else's truth claims and see what I make of them. It enables you to deconstruct what everybody else has told you. Now, you would ask yourself, why would you do this? What is the end game here? I'm saying my end game is not shifting. The end game isn't shifting perspective in and of itself. The end game is to, is to, in as much as it's possible, leave bias behind, see things the way things really are, in as much as it's possible. Um, I might want to actually understand my fellow human being as much as I possibly can. If I disagree with someone fundamentally, I want to know why they're why I'm disagreeing with them. What is it that they see that I don't? That what is it that I'm missing? that they can see. For example, um, take uh, the debate that's all the go these days, the clash of civilizations. I've recently completed a trip to the Islamic world, to Morocco, and I've, I've been there before. Not, it's not that recent, it was back in September, but one of the reasons I wanted to go was I wanted to see the world from their perspective. What is it that makes them cling so doggedly to a, an ideology or a point of view that I disagree with so fundamentally? I've made a gazillion videos in the past where I denounced Islamophobia uh, as a um, essentially form of racism. Um, but at the same time, I do not in any way, shape, or form see Islam as a point of view that I am likely to adopt ever. I can't, uh, again, when you're looking at things, when you value seeing the things through the other person's point of view as much as I do, you almost can't subscribe to any sort of ism, because you're just going back into some little cocoon. You're saying, I'm only going to see things from here on in from this one perspective, this an Islamic perspective, and I'm, and I'm going to resist any other perspectives or any other attempts at shifting my perspectives. So I don't want to, I don't want to adopt Islam. But by the same token, I want to understand why this person clings so doggedly to an argument or to a point of view or to a philosophy or whatever that I find so fundamentally flawed. What is it that makes people cling doggedly to this, to this ideology that I simply can't accept? Switching paradigms, switching perspectives enables you in a small way, and I think you can train yourself to do this, to understand where that person is coming from. You still may not agree with what they're saying, and I certainly still don't. I didn't come back from... I've been to Morocco and Turkey and Tunisia and Indonesia and Malaysia. I've never, I've never come out of those places any more Islamic than I am now. It, it just... You know, I, I don't know. I don't fear being infected by attempting to see the world by from their point of view. But I want to understand what is happening here when we have this quote-unquote clash of civilizations taking place. When from my perspective it's so clear that the Islamic world is quote-unquote wrong here, why do they stick so doggedly to it? Well, they have their reasons. If you see the world from their perspective, you will see why they cling so doggedly to it. They undoubtedly see the West in the same way. The West is so fundamentally wrong, um, because it's out of step, I suppose they would say, with God's plan. Why does the West cling to its wrongness so doggedly? Well, because 
we have a fundamentally different perspective. Now, understanding what is going on there, understanding the fundamental biases there, I think, um, is a virtue. Um, I think that it's a great virtue to try and understand biases, the better to arrive closer to an approximation of the truth. I'm not saying there isn't a truth out there, although I suppose I may have used those exact words. But when you're talking about truths, you've got to be... It's tricky. Are you talking about the map? Or are you talking about the terrain? The truth itself is beyond words. The truth itself doesn't need any diagram to show it. The truth is directly experienced. A diagram of a truth... Whew, how, do you, how do you describe the truth? eons ago when I first started out on YouTube, again speaking from a point of view of Islam, I wonder what has occurred to people, say, when they're on the Hajj in Mecca, when they're going around the Kaaba and they're, you know, that sort of thing where you see everyone sort of swirling closer and closer towards that artifact, the meteorite, and they get to kiss it. Um, I wonder what's going through their minds. Are they swept up in the atavistic joy of the moment and they can't believe that they're engaging in something so profound, but I wonder if occasionally, and maybe not occasionally, maybe more more commonly than one than they would like to think, somebody asks themselves, "I wonder if I really believe all of this. Really, do I actually am I convinced by all of this, or do I want to be convinced?" And by the same token, the same sort of thought, the same extremely disturbing thought, for a devout Muslim making the Hajj. Do any of these other people believe all of this? Are we all just, in a sense, deluding ourselves? Maybe I don't really fundamentally believe this, but I tell myself that I do believe it. And maybe everybody else is doing exactly the same thing. Maybe none of us believe any of this. You know, that's that's a crisis of faith. That's your classic crisis of faith, right? You're, you're not really... You don't really trust the the fundamentals of your belief and you're tr you're wrestling with that right you're wrestling with this sort of dark night of the soul where you sort of go do i really believe what i tell myself i believe and what i tell others that i believe do i really believe this and more importantly do any of these other people believe any of this or am i simply using this their apparent belief to bolster my belief and they're doing the same thing this is the value I find in perspectivism. It can be frightening because, in a sense, you're arguing certain truths out of existence. But I would say you're only arguing maps out of existence. You're not arguing the terrain out of existence. Because, as I always say, reality seems bloody real. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying that none of, none of us exist and we're all in a simulation or anything like that. We may be, we may not be, but whatever that's to me that's not really all that relevant what I want to know is what's going on in everybody else's mind now you ask yourself of what value is this well I would say that um, one of the first virtues that you have to yourself and I think that virtues to oneself are extremely important in, when you're dealing with things like virtue is truthfulness you have to be honest with yourself you have to be brutally honest if necessary now a lot of people don't think that we really ought to be brutally honest um, brutal honesty comes across in things like Plato's allegory of the cave when one of the prisoners who's living a fairly limited and kind of miserable existence down in the cave is suddenly yanked up and thrown out without any warning into the bright sunlight he may go insane in fact, I would say that there's a fairly good chance that he would go insane. He'd go into a state of existential panic, I guess. And existential panic is pretty darn close to at least believing for the moment that you are going completely out of your mind, that your brain is being zapped and you, you, know, you can't cope with reality anymore. That's what will happen, I guess, when you have an existential crisis, as you have this um, moment where 
you suddenly become aware that you've been deluding yourself or you have been you have lived in a state of darkness and the light is terrifying um, that's what that's what non-examination can help you avoid um, non self examination non skepticism I guess um, there's a fellow named uh, Peter Vessel Sopfe, Zapfe, I guess he's called, with whom I kind of disagree because he's an antinatalist, which I I don't agree with, um, strongly don't agree with. But he raises a lot of interesting points that are raised in other traditions, but he raises them to bolster his idea. But one of the interesting ones is anchoring. We all have anchors that we drop to allow ourselves to make sense of reality. And what is an anchor, ultimately, in the way that he uses it? It's dropping your your anchor anywhere and saying, this henceforth shall be my perspective. This is from this is the point from which I will now see everything else. I'll read off, I'll be kind of quick here, what Zapfe says in The Last Messiah. The mechanism of anchoring also serves from early childhood. Parents, home, the street, become matters of course to the child and give it a sense of assurance. This sphere of experience is the first and perhaps the happiest protection against the cosmos that we ever get to know in life. Protection against the cosmos, that's interesting. That's almost refers to cosmicism, which is Lovecraft's idea that we live in a completely empty, uncaring, cold, and pointless universe. Um, a fact that doubtless explains the much debated infantile bonding. The question of whether that is sexually tainted too is unimportant here. When the child later discovers that those fixed points are arbitrary and ephemeral, are as arbitrary and ephemeral as any others, it has a crisis of confusion and anxiety and promptly looks around for another anchoring. In autumn, I will attend middle, middle school. That's there is another anchor. If the substitution somehow fails, then the crisis may take a fatal course. In other words, you go mad or you kill yourself or, you know, you just collapse. Um, or else what I will call an anchoring spasm occurs. An anchoring spasm. Now, that's interesting. I think I would call an anchoring spasm what fanaticism is. One clings to the dead values, concealing as well as possible from oneself and others the fact that they are unworkable that one is spiritually insolvent. The result is lasting insecurity, feelings of inferiority, overcompensation, restlessness. Insofar as this state falls into certain categories, it is made subject to psychoanalytic treatment, which aims to complete the transition to new anchorings. Now, again, I'm not saying that I'm a Zapfian. I'm not. In fact, I heartily disagree with the fellow. But he raises, sorry, I'm adjusting the contrast here as the sun rises in front of me. Um, he uses this to describe why people fix their perspectives. They fix their perspectives because to not do so would apparently drive people insane. We're, again, we're left with that question. Uh, from Plato's allegory of the cave, what happens when one of the prisoners is tossed out into the bright sunlight? Um, what happens when you see reality completely, from a completely and utterly different perspective than anything you have ever experienced before, without warning? And this is done without warning. In the case of the last Messiah, Zafi's caveman is killed by a sudden realization of that what everything that he's henceforth or heretofore believed um, has been an anchor nothing but an anchor, a contrivance now again, is being truthful to oneself a virtue? I believe it is now, being truthful to oneself means challenging one's own conception of truth I think that you have to do that um, in order to be honest with yourself do I really believe what I tell myself that I believe? Well, people will say, well, you can't make any progress if you constantly question yourself that way. Yes, I can. I'm making progress towards the truth. Do I have, do I have um, 
an obligation to truthfulness to myself. Yes, I would certainly say I, I do. Self-delusion, conscious self-delusion, is, in my opinion, a vice. I don't want to deliberately delude myself. So I have to ask myself, do I believe what I tell myself I believe? Do other people believe what they tell themselves that they believe? Or why do people cling doggedly to things that I find so unconvincing? They have their reasons. There's reasons. And so I have to learn what those reasons are if I want to understand why someone is going to disagree with me so vehemently. Why would we want to do that? Well, there's only one reason. We want to see things and ourselves for what we and the exterior truly is. The only way I think to do that is to, as much as it's possible, remove bias. Removing bias may have the effect on most people of flying into a state of existential panic. I get it. You're yanking the carpet out from underneath them. You're cutting the cord of their anchor. Okay. I'm not so much interested in doing that to other people as I am in trying to understand why they resist having that anchor line cut. Why is it that people doggedly believe things that are so obviously, in my, from my point of view, rubbish, i.e. the religious or, you know, in, or other religions that I don't follow or whatever, or other isms that I don't follow? I've always struggled with the idea, why would anyone ever want to be a communist? Um, I don't know, but I'm sure that they have their reasons. They must or they wouldn't be a communist, right? Um, and why do they stick so doggedly to it when I think that it's just such a rubbish idea? Well, I can say, well, the person is a heretic or the person is wrong or the person is, you know, um, uh, uncooperative or deliberately deluding themselves uh, or whatever or just doing this for nefarious reasons, you know. Um, the person is a cultural Marxist, so they're fundamentally flawed. That's why. Emmanuel Goldstein, you know, um, Snowball from Animal Farm. There's always got to be some sort of reason to say that is a fundamentally wrong person when you're dealing with anchoring, because people won't, people will doggedly refuse to share your anchoring and will doggedly cling to their anchor. This is not an end in itself to cut everyone else's anchor line. I understand that there are people who are going to say that yes it is an end in itself or effectively it ends up being an end in itself but that too is a species of anchoring. You're only trying to cut my anchor line because you have ill intent here. You want to actually harm me. Um, that's one of those you know that's one one of the pieces in your armor of faith is understanding why someone would attempt to tempt you the way Satan tempted who knows whom in the Bible. Um, why would they want to do that? Why would Satan want you to switch your perspective? Why would, you know, isn't that what temptation is? Temptation is to see things from another point of view. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to try and entice someone to do that? Well, because you're just plain evil. Again, you're a cultural Marxist. Um, I'd be careful of that. I'd be careful of this whole idea of denunciation of this sort of thing. Um, unless, of course, you're not really interested in being truthful to yourself and to others. Because denunciation is a form of anchoring and otherizing anybody who disagrees with you. You're just saying they're just plain wrong. They are wrong. They're just... they're kafir, they're, or kufar, or whatever the word is. They're heathens, they're uh, just people who have deliberately stepped out of the obvious truth of things, um, and for nefarious reasons. Um, to me, that's a, that's a species of self-deception. You're simplifying something that may not be so simple at all. This person may actually have reasons for using a different anchor than you do. They may have very powerful and very valid reasons from their perspective. You will never understand them unless you learn to see things from that other person's perspective. 
the point here is not to destroy anything. The point here is to understand things. The point here is to be truthful with oneself. People say you can't get anything done unless you have a fixed point. I would say absolutely that is incorrect. You, can get, you can't get anything done until you can shift your perspectives. What's the first thing that you have to do in the search for truth? That, is, that I would say, is to be utterly truthful with yourself. You have to sort of examine bias within and without. And perspectivism is a tool that enables you to do that. It's not a, an end in itself. It is simply a means to deal with bias. More to follow.